So there will be uh, several new devices that we'll discuss that's off-label use. I don't have any other relevant relationships to disclose. Tricuspid regurgitation is very common and um, it's often under-recognized and under-treated from an invasive perspective. Um, the most common etiology we see is functional tricuspid regurgitation. And this is a result of annular dilatation in most cases. And we see that the annulus enlarges in the direction of the free wall of the right ventricle uh, between the anterior and posterior leaflets. And oftentimes it's in patients who have atrial fibrillation and right atrial enlargement. And that seems to be one of the contributors to the enlargement we see. Oftentimes they have an atrial myopathy and many of the patients have some element of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and have uh, some degree of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure elevation. And many have also had previous left-sided valve surgery. Now, there are many other important causes of TR as well, including device lead-associated TR and also patients with uh, RV dysfunction that precedes the TR. And in those patients, there's uh, more of an element of tricuspid leaflet tethering and then there is a group of patients with tricuspid leaflet prolapse as one of the mechanisms of the TR as well that we see. And many other causes that are less common. But what we know is that isolated tricuspid regurgitation is associated with reduced survival, the more severe it is. And this is data from Mayo Clinic showing that the larger effective regurgitant orifice, particularly the threshold of 40, is associated with higher mortality. and um, and there have been several other studies showing similar findings. But despite that, we know that isolated tricuspid valve surgery is rarely performed, and the in-hospital mortality is typically high if you look at um, the uh, national trends. And oftentimes, this is because of comorbidities associated with the tricuspid regurgitation. We looked at our experience of patients referred for tricuspid intervention over a two-year period, and we found that only 10% of those patients underwent surgery, and 15% underwent off-label percutaneous interventions. The, the remainder of patients, which was three-quarters, were managed medically, and that is primarily diuretic therapy, and that's mostly due to lack of therapeutic options. And I think this reflects the practice um, around the country and the world as well, that we uh, traditionally manage this with diuretics. There are a lot of new therapies that are um, under investigation. Now, tricuspid valve and valve, and occasionally valve and ring, um, has been done now for many years in patients who have prior surgery. Um, but we're gonna talk about other therapies instead here, and that includes uh, annuloplasty and spacer therapy, Although for today's talk, we're going to focus more on edge-to-edge -edge repair and transcatheter replacement, as these are the most commonly being done therapies and the ones with the largest trials enrolling right now. For edge-to-edge -edge repair, we have two devices, the MitraClip and the Pascal device. And these were part of several devices that were studied in the Trivalve Registry that was published in 2019. This was a heterogeneous group of procedures for TR, many different devices of 312 patients. And they found that one of the predictors of procedural success in terms of the degree of TR reduction was how much leaflet tethering was present. Another way to describe that would be the coaptation depth of the tricuspid leaflets. And the more severe tethering that was present was associated with a higher risk of residual TR and a lesser chance of procedural success. These patients were also con compared to a control group of medically managed patients, and there was uh, propensity matching done to try to match the groups as well as possible. And they found that patients who were treated with intervention had less um, heart failure and a better overall survival compared to the propensity matched groups. So this was suggestive that there may be clinical benefits with treating the TR. But this has yet to be shown in a randomized trial, so this is merely an association at this point. We don't have strong evidence that treating the TR improves those outcomes yet. 
In our own experience, we found that there's a steep learning curve to edge-to-edge tricuspid repair. And one of the major obstacles of this is the imaging and being able to see all of the views needed on the tricuspid valve. There's a big learning curve associated with that. And in this example here, we show the the procedural time of combined mitroclip and off-label tricuspid clipping. And you can see that that procedural time was cut in half over the first 20 cases. And there was also some reduction in residual MR and TR over this time too. There are many different challenges that contribute to the complexity of uh, tricuspid edge to edge repair procedure. One of the biggest ones is procedural imaging. Um, particularly if there's shadowing from left-sided structures such as prosthetic valves or the interatrial septum, or if the, horiz- the heart has a horizontal axis, that will also um, make the tricuspid valve harder to see. Complex chordal anatomy is, is a bigger challenge with the tricuspid valve than the mitral valve. Large gaps, particularly a large septolateral gap and or large anterior-posterior gap, make it harder to Uh, achieve good results. And then, of course, severe leaflet tethering or reduced leaflet mobility will make it harder as well. Additionally, we've seen that fluid status also affects outcomes. And in patients who have very high right atrial pressures and volume overload pre-admission with um, optimizing their fluid status beforehand can really help reduce the gaps and make the procedure more successful. This is an example of a patient we treated with edge to repair with a Pascal device in the CLASP TR trial, an 80-year-old man with functional TR. And you can see the transgastric short axis view here of the tricuspid valve with the leaflets labeled posterior, septal, and anterior. And um, here the plan was to place a device between the anterior and septal leaflets as that was the location of the most severe TR. We also look in the esophageal views at the tricuspid inflow view and use um, biplane imaging to show the leaflets. And this is the view that we would usually use to grasp the leaflets with the device. Here's the device being positioned and we check the um, trajectory of the device to make sure that it's perpendicular to the tricuspid valve plane. And then after we've uh, confirmed a good trajectory and we've adjusted the position of the device very carefully with many different controls on the delivery system. We then look at the device in the transgastric view with the arms open. And the transgastric short axis view is a critical view to showing how the arms are oriented relative to the leaflets. And that ensures that we're going to grasp the leaflets exactly where we want to in terms of the location of the TR and also avoiding the uh, cords that may get in the way. And then here is an example uh, in this procedure of grasping the anterior leaflet here. You can see it's falling on this arm of the device and then the clasp is lowered, which secures the leaflet down. And then we can swing the device over to the septal leaflet and then lower that clasp once we have enough leaflet. So here, we got part of the septal leaflet, but it's not quite optimized. We don't have as much as we want. You can see a lot of tension on the anterior leaflet as we've swung over. So we look at it in the transgastric view, and we see how far the leaflet is uh, going into the arm of the device. And if it's less than 50%, we would optimize it by um, moving the device even more septal raising and lowering the clasp to ensure that we have enough leaflet inserted. And this will ensure um, that we reduce the TR as much as possible and we minimize any risk of device detachment. So once we're satisfied with our position, we close the arms of the device and then we assess the residual TR. And it looks like we've really reduced the TR over here on the right with the device closed. And here it is um, after we've um, deployed the device and released it from the delivery system and really just trivial residual TR here with the device in position. At baseline, this is the transthoracic echo. You can see the baseline severe TR. And then on the right here, after the device is put in, there's just mild residual TR post-procedure. 
We've also found that in some cases of edge to edge repair, it's very helpful to have intracardiac echo available because of shadowing of the leaflets, particularly in patients who have um, left sided, um, previous left sided surgery. Um, the intracardiac echo can show the leaflets even better than TEE and facilitate grasping of the leaflets. As you see in these example images, you see a mitra clip device and the uh, gripper um, grippers being lowered on the leaflet. Um, this is another example of a patient that has multiple device leads and the intracardiac echo showed the leaflets better. Uh, there was less shadowing from all of these device leads with intracardiac echo than there was with TEE. And in this case, this patient with congenital heart disease, a prior tricuspid annuloplasty, and a flail septal leaflet, this could not be seen at all with TEE because of all the previous surgeries that patient had had from their congenital heart disease. And the intracardiac echo was the only thing that would show us the leaflets well enough to grasp them. And we were able to achieve a good result for this patient. We studied our use of intracardiac echo in our early experience of tricuspid edge to edge repair, and this was published last year. And we showed that our use of intracardiac echo has increased over time for tricuspid edge to edge repair as we've gained more experience with it for this utility. And um, what we found is that in cases where it was used, we actually had better visualization of the tricuspid leaflets than with TEE alone in 40% of those cases. Um, as an adeno, we now have 3D ice available, intracardiac echo, and this is also um, being used and provides uh, the option of having biplane imaging as well. And also, as mentioned, 3D imaging, which improves the capability of the ice as well. So we're excited about the, the role of this in tricuspid interventions. The 30-day outcomes of the CLASP-TR early feasibility study were published and the six-month outcomes have also been presented uh, with similar findings. And what we found was that the NYHA functional class improved in 90% um, of patients at 30 days. The TR severity improved by two or more grades in the majority of patients as well. But the majority of patients had moderate residual TR. And we also found improvement in the six-minute walk distance and quality of life. The one-year results are also going to be presented at ACC this year from this trial as well and are eagerly anticipated. Additionally, this is now in a pivotal trial phase where this Pascal device is being compared to uh, medical therapy as well. There's also a randomized trial of the TriClip device, which is very similar um, and that's called the Triluminate trial. So both of those trials are enrolling patients and will give us very important information about the benefit of edge-to-edge -edge repair in patients compared to diuretic therapy alone. Here's another patient, an 80-year-old woman with severe TR, and you can see the transgastric short-axis view of her TE shows a large anteroposterior gap and also a large sorry, a large septolateral gap and also a large anterior-posterior gap of her tricuspid valve. She had more leaflet tethering than the previous patient I showed you and torrential TR. And um, her anatomy was felt to be more extreme and perhaps more suitable for a replacement than edge-to-edge -edge repair. And the CT analysis is an important part of determining if patients are candidates for replacement. We look at the annular size and we look at the degree of diastolic oversizing for a potential device. The papillary muscle anatomy is carefully examined as well as the angle of the inferior vena cava to the right ventricle and the tricuspid leaflet anatomy. And this patient was evaluated for the evoke transcatheter replacement valve. This was studied in uh, the first in human experience of 25 patients, and this was published last year. And the technical success rate was high at 92%, with no interprocedural mortality or conversion to open surgery, and no 30-day mortality. And this is a transfemoral delivered self-expanding device, and it has nine anchors around the device, which facilitate the positioning 
and the leaflets of the tricuspid valve are fall inside of the anchors, and that's part of how the device stays in place. You can see the majority of patients had improvement in NYHA class at one month, and the TR reduction was fairly impressive with over half of patients having no residual TR and the majority of the remainder of patients only having mild residual TR. So this patient was enrolled into the triluminate, or sorry, the, um, the Trisend trial of the Evoke valve, which is a uh, randomized trial comparing this device to medical therapy. And you can see the device is in position. The wire is in the right ventricle. The nose cone is in the right ventricle as well. And these are the anchors being slowly um, expanded and unsheathed by the delivery system on the ventricular aspect. At the same time, we're looking carefully with TEE imaging to see those anchors unfolding on the ventricular side of the tricuspid valve. And multiplanar reconstruction imaging by TEE is essential here. A lot of time is taken to make sure that the leaflets are falling inside of the anchors. And um, again, this is predominantly done with multiplanar reconstruction imaging. You can see the device is more fully expanded on the ventricular side now here on the right-hand side. And the leaflets are being scanned all the way around the perimeter of the device to make sure that the tricuspid leaflets are falling inside of the anchors. And here the device is being released finally. Uh, this is the final release of the device on the RAO view. And then the corresponding uh, um, LAO view shows the short axis of this replacement valve. Um, and here is the TE images after it's been released. You can see the device in place. It's, it's very stable in position. You have nice laminar throw, flow through the valve and no residual tricuspid regurgitation. Similarly, there's no paraprosthetic leak here on the uh, color 3D views. This is showing both the atrial and the ventricular aspects of the device. And the right atrial pressure did change. Uh, Pre-procedure, we see a ventricularized waveform. Post-procedure, it's much uh, flatter of a, of a waveform now and uh, more of an appropriate atr right atrial waveform. Now, the pressure is still high, though, and we have seen that these patients do need continued diuresis after the procedure is done to help, um, uh, help them uh, diurese through all of the uh, excess fluid that they have. Additionally, they tend to have RV dysfunction, and it takes time for um, them to, to really get used to having this device in place. Our current algorithm for treatment of patients with severe TR is, is currently un, in flux, but um, our approach is to look at the patient's uh, record for patients referred for TR, look at their echo images, and, and exclude any concomitant valve disease. And um, once we've done that, we then look at the mechanism of TR by echo. Um, another important part is to ensure that patients are, um, are taking a diuretic. We also look at whether uh, they have atrial fibrillation or not. Now, there's some patients with severe TR who aren't on a diuretic and don't need it. Um, and, but um, other patients um, who, who do have significant volume overload and would benefit from diuretic therapy. Um, we then also look at their symptom status and whether or not any intervention is needed. Sometimes exercise hemodynamics can be helpful to determine whether or not symptoms are due to the TR. And uh, typically this would include a supine bicycle hemodynamic study in the cath lab where we perform uh, right heart catheterization, and we look at the simultaneous right atrial and wedge pressures to determine the relative changes in those pressures with exercise. And that can be very helpful to confirm that the TR is causing symptoms. Um, in patients with primary TR due to prolapse or flail, these patients may be candidates for the edge-to-edge -edge repair option. Um, in patients with isolated TR, um, which is atrial functional TR, and they've had a short duration of AFib, we sometimes would consider a trial of rhythm control because we can see the TR improves by 
uh, correction of AFib in patients who don't have long-standing AFib. Um, in patients who have very long-standing AFib, we would then focus more on the TR and see about um, either edge-to-edge -edge repair or replacement options. Now, of course, surgery is always considered in these patients too, but the majority of these patients are high risk for surgery, and that's why you don't see it on this algorithm. But of course, uh, any patient that we're considering for a transcatheter intervention, we would also have evaluated by CV surgery. Um, for patients who have ventricular functional TR and more significant tethering of the leaflets, these are typically not as good candidates for edge to edge repair, and we would evaluate them more for a replacement option through the TRISEN trial. Uh, for device lead related TR, we often will consider whether or not lead extraction is an option or not and whether that's feasible and safe. If so, we could try for that first, and if they're device dependent, place a leadless pacemaker, and then that might make them a better candidate for an intervention. But typically, device lead related TR is not well treated with edge to edge repair, and replacement is the main option for these patients. And we have successfully performed uh, transcatheter replacement uh, for this mechanism of TR. So that's a lot of information and just a highlight of some of the uh, advances in the field of transcatheter tricuspid intervention. We discussed that severe TR reduces longevity and quality of life, and it's undertreated. And we emphasize the importance of detailed TE imaging to define the tricuspid anatomy. We also showed how intracardiac echo is a useful adjunct, and we're continuing to learn more about this and excited about the advances of the technology that are becoming available. There's a steep learning curve for tricuspid edge-to-edge -edge repair, and it appears to be safe, and the results uh, so far have shown um, a moderate degrees of TR reduction, usually 50% or more reduction in TR severity and improvement in quality of life at 30 days and beyond. And the transcatheter tricuspid replacement appears to be safe and eliminates TR. And all of these therapies are being evaluated in randomized trials. And uh, we'll have results from these in the years to come. So thank you for your attention. And please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions.